All right, everybody. So we have Dr. Sean Baker with us today. Uh, he is a high-level athlete and a doctor. So welcome, Sean. Uh, welcome. Thanks for having me. It's wonderful, Dave. And uh, so for today, we said we were going to have the donation go towards Autism Speaks. So can you just briefly explain why we chose that one? Yeah, I mean, my oldest son, Saxon, he is uh, uh, 13 years old. and or, no, He's about to turn 13 years old in March, and he is autistic. And so it's just uh, something that's near and dear to my heart, obviously. Awesome. Um, and, you know, this whole carnivore diet thing has blown up a lot in the last year. Uh, you've got tens of thousands of followers on Instagram and you're on Twitter. Uh, and, but how did you even stumble upon that? Because, you know, you obviously are a medical doctor yourself. And I, I think a lot of people would question the health of it, which, you know, we'll get into that as well. Uh, but how did you even get into that? Yeah, I mean, it started like for many, many physicians that, that sort of do this. It's your own personal journey. You know, I'm uh, I turned 52 in a couple of days and, you know, when I was probably, I guess, early 40s, despite really high level athletics, I mean, I was still a very, very successful and, and very, uh, you know, competitive athlete who was training hard. I saw my health start to falter and then I started to look to diet as a uh, means to sort of, you know, reverse uh, some of the things I was seeing, which were probably, you know, early metabolic disease and things that I would, you know, I would have normally associated with aging. but. So I went through about, you know, four or five years of experimentation with diet and, you know, eventually after going through the whole gamut, you know, including, you know, uh, you know, a low fat, uh, high vegetable, nearly vegetarian diet down to a paleo diet, down to a low carb and then a ketogenic diet for several years, I, I kind of stumbled across this, you know, kind of this all carnivorous type diet. And I thought, well, I'm open enough to try it and to see what the results were and, you know, I did it for a month and got really good results. And I thought it was just a one month deal uh, just to try it out as for fun. And when I went back to what I was eating before, which was more of a ketogenic style diet, mm -hmm. I just didn't feel as good. And so I said, well, I'd, you know, all things being equal, I'd rather feel, perform and, and, and function well. And so I decided to continue doing that. And so now for over two years, I've been on a, you know, basically a fully carnivorous diet. And uh, yes, I would, you know, again, if you would ask me three or four years ago, I would have said, yeah, it's absolutely doesn't make any sense based on what we know about nutrition. But, you know, I think uh, we have to be open enough to look at results. And, you know, we, you know, really meat has never, you know, meat gets a bad rap just because we have epidemiology, which, you know, looks at people that eat meat. And most of those people that, that tend to do that because they don't, because they've been told meat is bad, they don't care about the other aspects of their health. And so we have all these what we call confounders or what's called a healthy user bias, or in this case, an unhealthy user bias where most meat eaters don't care about their weight. They don't care. They tend to smoke more. They tend to drink more. They tend to not exercise. They tend to not see the position. They tend to not wear their seat belts. You know, and the list goes on and on and on. And so when you actually see what happens to people that are actually health conscious and actually just eat meat, surprising things happen and it's completely opposite of what we've been told happens you know basically people get healthier and they lose weight they get leaner their blood pressure normalizes their blood glucose stabilizes their insulin sensitivity improves their you know their mental health teams tends to improve their joint pain tends to improve their digestion tends to improve their skin tends to improve you know every every sort of subjective and objective measurement that you can look at seems to improve with the only exception being that for some people and not all people, but some people, they see a little bump in their LDL cholesterol, which I think mm -hmm. at this point in 2019, many people question uh, the relevance of that in all situations. You know, is it, is it situa situationally uh, problematic or is it problematic in all cases? And I think that the former is probably what we're going to find out. Right. And uh, actually, I'll, I'll back up a little bit. You know, we talked about you being an, an athlete and, you know, you're not just somebody who works out. You're actually a very high level athlete, which is rare to see in somebody who is also a medical doctor. So um, can you just go into your athletic background a little bit? And yeah, I've been an athlete my whole life. I mean, I was, uh, you know, I guess early on in my college days and then into medical school, I, I was a pretty high level rugby player. In fact, I left medical school to go play uh, semi-professionally in New Zealand. Did that for several years, played about about seven, eight years before I got tired of getting my head kicked in. I uh, was a pretty successful power lifter. I was a national record holder with with as a drug-free uh, deadlifter, deadlifting uh, uh, 772 pounds was my was my best. Uh, wow. Then I had to start my medical residency, which, you know, that was during medical school. So, that it, it, you know, when you, when you do a residency, particularly a surgical residency, you don't get much sleep and you don't get much time sure. to train. So, 
my only regret is I probably think I could have pulled 800 pounds if I didn't have to start my medical residency. But anyway, that's water under the bridge. Uh, I then went on to some high-level strongman stuff in my sort of mid-30s. I took fifth at the first national championships we ever, championships we ever had, so I was pretty decent at strongman sports. Uh, I took up a competitive throwing in my early 40s, and I, I got involved in Highland Games, which is, you know, you run around in a kilt and you throw cabers, right. stones, and weights, and hammers, and I ended up winning the national and then the world championships as a master's athlete in that sport. Uh, I took up a little bit of track and field for a little while, and I ended up throwing all American levels as a master's athlete. I think in the discus and the in the weight and the super weight throws, and then I got into into rowing. It's, it's into indoor rowing stuff right now, and, and then I currently uh, have I think about six American records and set several several world records in that sport. And so that's what I'm doing. And that's where my focus is right now. In fact, there's a world championships in, in indoor rowing coming to Long Beach, California next month, which I'm going to go and compete at and hopefully uh, win the world championships in that. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I've, I've been, been a pretty high level driven athlete my whole life. I like to compete. Uh, and the interesting thing about this diet has is it has really prolonged and improved my uh, and prolonged my career and improved my performance, which I think is also something that many people would not expect. Yeah, I mean, not that that 50 is necessarily old, but that's pretty incredible that you're still competing at that level. You know, we often think of peak athletes being, you know, late 20s, early 30s. So that, that's pretty awesome. Yeah, I mean, you know, at least on the rowing machine, particularly in the sprint distances, I can hang with pretty much any world class athlete in their 20s and 30s, you know, at, at, at 52. So I'm pretty, pretty pleased to be able to be doing that. So that's that's kind of cool. Very cool. Yeah. So, you know, I know uh, I'm not really somebody who looks too much into people say like, oh, our ancestor did X, Y, Z. Um, to me, you know, let's say our ancestors, it was proven that they ate only vegetables. Well, that doesn't matter to me if we can know that now eating all meat was somehow better, you know. So I think it can have relevance, but it's not super important to me. Uh, but with that being said, do you think our bodies are, I guess, quote unquote, designed to be eating all meat all the time or, you know, based on our anatomy, what do you think there? Well, I mean, certainly we are well designed to process meat. I mean, you know, we, we, we're designed to hunt. I mean, you know, you, you can, you know, we can discount the evolutionary argument, but I do think, I do think it informs us a little bit. And I agree, you know, the best test is what, what happens in 2019 when people do this stuff. And that's, that's the best way to get your answers. You just test it directly. But I mean, all the rest of this stuff is just kind of storytelling and it makes for a nice story. But I mean, you know, from an evolutionary standpoint, you know, our shoulder, our shoulder anatomy developed to throw. We threw, we weren't throwing to knock mangoes out of a tree. I mean, we were throwing mm -hmm. to, to kill other animals. I mean, we have a, uh, you know, extremely acidic uh, pH in our gastric, you know, our gastric acid, you know, our pH is, you know, one, 1 1.5 for a normal healthy human being that, that rivals uh, even, even other carnivore animals, which are, uh, sitting at a pH of about two to three, we're, we're even more acidic than that because probably we started out scavenging. And, and so our, our, our pH and our, and our gastric acid is, is similar to that of a hyena or a vulture, which are scavenger animals. And that's probably because we came across meat that had been sitting out for a while. And that, and that extremely acidic environment kills the, uh, the pathogens, the, you know, the, the bacteria and other organisms that, that, are, that are sitting in the meat. And then probably through most of our evolution, as we hunted these big, large megafaunal animals, you know, you kill a big mammoth and you've got a lot of meat, which you have to preserve, you know, either through drying or, or freezing or sticking underwater. And it's going to get some bacteria on there as well. Uh, and so we probably dealt with that for, you know, a couple million years. You know, Homo erectus probably was the first really true, very good hunter, you know, maybe circa 100, you know, 1.5 million years ago. And they're very effective at killing uh, these megafaunal animals, particularly elephants and mammoths, uh, you know, we've got, uh, you know, we've got specific transporters, you know, in our, in our GI tract designed to, to, to absorb components that are only found in meat like carnosine and carnitine. We have specific transporters in our gut for that reason. Uh, you know, our small intestine is extremely effective at absorbing, uh, you know, meat from our, from our digestive tract and, and, and to the point that there's almost no waste made. And that's one of the things that people notice when they go on a carnivore diet, they don't make much waste anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, if we look at our fermentative capacity, you know, based on anatomy, which is, you know, uh, one of the biggest things that evolution drives is actually anatomy you know, in, in, in a larger scale. And we look at that and we compare cecum, colon, and, and you know, hindgut, foregut proportions, we are almost identical to cats and dogs with regard to our fermentative capacity, which is about 17% of our 
uh, gastrointestinal tract. So, you know, and so it's not that we probably only ate meat all the time, but I think, uh, for, again, from an evolutionary argument, you think about it, if there were some required plant or plant nutrient, uh, what would that be? And, and no one can name that because there's no, you know, it's not like every, every human in a the plant has to eat avocados or blueberries. It, it just doesn't exist. Yeah, uh, and to think that if you, if something like that did exist, well, then man would have never migrated out of Africa or wherever or Asia, depending on what we seem to think these days. But um, so to 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 make it from Africa and then spread across the entire world, and remember, for much of human evolution, it was during the ice ages. I mean, it was it was it, if you look at the climate records, you know, it's clearly ice age for most of that time, and so it's mostly grasslands, and there's not a lot of variety there, and so probably we depended upon meat as a majority of our diet and it probably at times exclusively for our diet to survive and i think uh you know just because we have opportunity to eat other things doesn't necessarily mean that's the ideal diet for us you know right now i mean i'm sure if prehistoric man had access to uh popcorn and twinkies and doritos they would have eaten it i mean it's clear right. we just eat whatever we've got available to us and right, it, right. it doesn't mean just because we have access to it means that's necessarily the ideal thing for us and so i agree with you Evolution can, you know, sort of give us a clue as to what we might be eating. Now, clearly, none of us were eating vegetable oils. None of us were eating high fructose syrup, corn syrup. None of us were eating refined, highly ultra-processed carbohydrates. I mean, that just didn't exist. So we don't we don't have to debate what people ate back then because we know it didn't exist because those things came into existence in the 20th century for the most part. So we can we can at least use that to inform us what we maybe not should be eating. You know, mm-hmm. and, and I think I think most people agree on those things. Uh, but 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 again, the, the evolutionary stuff is fun to talk about. I think it's neat. It's fascinating. But you're right. Until we invent a time machine, you know, we're never going to know for sure. And so the right. best thing to do is, you know, test it out on yourself and see what happens. Right. A very comprehensive answer. So as far as I've seen on your Instagram, you know, you're not eating just beef. I know some people actually do just specifically eat beef all day, every day. It seems like you're including salmon and even eggs and some butter. Um, so were you ever just having beef and then tried to branch out a little bit or what allowed you to include things like butter? Yeah, I mean, I've gone a long period of time on just beef and I think it's fine. I don't think there's any problem with that or people that have done that for decades and do just fine. I mean, I, I, you know, again, this is, you know, to take away the dogma from, from out of the diet and the religion out of the diet, I, I eat what I enjoy and what works for me well. And it may be some time that I include other, you know, uh, non-carnivorous foods in my diet. And if I tolerate that well, I'm completely fine with that. You know, if I want to eat some raspberries here and there, I may end up doing that if it, as long as it doesn't bother me. But, you know, I, I've eaten, you know, all along I've eaten, you know, when I first started, I ate far more variety. And then I got into a period where I ate pretty steadily just as much as steak and hamburger for the most part, maybe a few eggs here and there. And, and, and probably over the last you know, three, three to six months, you know, I've had a little bit more variety, but, but generally I'd still say that, you know, on, on the whole, probably 95% of the diet is, is red meat. You know, that's what I eat. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's what I really is satisfying to me. That's what really makes me feel good. I'll throw in some salmon, I'll throw in some eggs, I'll throw in a little bit of dairy here and there. Uh, and, and that works well for me. And, you know, I cook in butter, uh, but that's, uh, you know, that's, that's where I'm at right now. And you know, you're obviously a big guy. You're very active. How many calories are you consuming with this diet? You know, at maintenance, you know, and, and I'm not, and I'm not of the opinion that calories have no relevance. I think they do. I, I do think that a carnivorous diet gives you an advantage, particularly with regard to protein. As we know, there's, I mean, even the people that are diehard calories in, calories out people will concede that protein has a, uh, you know, a protective effect with regard to gaining body fat. We know that there's mm-hmm. probably, you know. And if you look at some of the studies, that probably a couple hundred calories, uh, you know, with a higher protein diet, you can get away with. And then, and then the questionable whether restriction of carbohydrate also provides an advantage. And David Ludwig's recent study uh, out of Harvard calls into question that, at least in the maintenance phase, where they looked at perhaps 200 to 400 calories a day potential advantage. But beyond that, you know, you can eat too much. You can still get fat on a carnivore diet. You, you sure. can do that. Uh, it's hard. I mean, meat is particularly satiating, so it's very difficult to do that. But I mean, when I am in a position, and currently right now, I'm just trying to lean out a little bit, so I'm eating a little bit less. But typically for me, uh, I would eat around four pounds of food. And if it's a fattier cut, that's probably 5,000 calories a day, which is a decent wow. amount. You know, yeah. and so so right now, as I'm leaning out, I'm probably cl- eating closer to 3,500, you know, uh, but still feeling fine and, and performing well and, uh, you know, eating plenty. I mean, 3,500 calories is not 
a little amount of food. Sure. You know I mean? A lot of people, you know, when they go on a diet, they're down around 12, 800, 1200 calories, which I think is just, you know, as misery. So yeah, I, you know, yeah. I, I don't need to do that, fortunately. Yeah, I, I mean, I historically have a, a huge appetite, but when I, I did just meat for a few days, um, I, I basically did an elimination diet, and so I just started with meat, and then I slowly added back from there. Um, I was maybe eating about 3,300 to 3,500 for those couple days, and it was very tough for me to eat all that just in meat. So 5,000, that's quite a bit. Um, and I think also during those two days, you know, you mentioned less waste. I don't think I went to the bathroom that entire two days. So it, are you at this point like, completely normal i mean we don't need like specific details but do you find people are fine in that regard yeah i mean yeah i mean i think what what happens to most people is they 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 become regular you know it, some people it takes a little while to adjust you know because they're used to having fiber and you know if we look at the, the job of the colon mm -hmm. i mean one of the jobs and one of the major jobs of the colon is to reabsorb fluid and electrolytes i mean that's sure. kind of what it does and then it expels a waste but when you're on an all meat diet, the only thing making it to your colon is liquid. You don't have any more fiber. You don't have more fiber or, or solid material, and so sometimes you know the, the colon is just not used to all that liquid, and so people end up with diarrhea actually initially. But then the colon kind of regains that capacity that it, it may have you know lost over a period of time just because it hasn't been utilized. Uh, but for me, yeah, I mean, I'm you know without getting any great details of being gross. I mean, I, I generally have a bowel movement once a day, maybe once every other day, and no issues you know it's fine you know, i don't i don't worry about it i don't think about it. you know there's no prize at the end of life for having more bowel movements right there's no there's no prize for having giant bowel movements in fact there's a nice study uh that dr dr peary p w e r y did in, i think in 2012 looking at uh uh diets uh you know with high fiber group having the highest amount of diverticulosis. The people mm, that had most yeah. bowel movements had the highest amount of diverticulosis. And the ones that had the least bowel movements had the least. And so there's there's a lot of, uh, you know, there's a lot, again, epidemiology that supports fiber in the diet. And again, you have to take that in the context of, uh, you know, a standard American diet, which is most of us will concede is a pretty a pretty junky diet. Right. Fiber, fiber in that situation is probably a net benefit. But I think in a carnivorous situation where you're not eating the processed grains and the high sugar diet and the high glycemic diet, fiber probably has minimal to no benefit. I know there's an argument about the gut microbiome, but in all honesty, I mean, we were so far in our infancy on gut microbiome that it's it's such speculation at this point. And I've not seen a single person on a carnivorous diet, you know, say anything, but for the most part, my digestion is improved. And, and, and so if we make the idea that gut health depends upon fiber, well then, you know, what is gut health? You know, if you say, well, gut health means bloating and pain and constipation, and lots of gas, I would say maybe that's not the best definition of gut health. And if you say gut health is, I don't even know I'm digesting anything anymore and everything's smooth and nothing hurts. To me, that's that's probably a better indication of gut health. You know, I know you talked about irritable bowel syndrome, but if we look at irritable bowel disease, which is a little bit different, those would be things like Crohn's disease and, and, and um, uh, ulcerative colitis. Colitis, yeah. You know, if you have those things, you know, your risk for cancer goes up tremendously. You know, that irritation inflammation causes a tremendous increase in your risk of, of colon cancer. And we talk about red meat and colon cancer. But what happens on people on these carnivorous diets is their ulcerative colitis goes away. Their Crohn's disease goes away in many cases or greatly improves. And therefore, you know, their risk for colon cancer has now gone down. You know, I know there's uh, the World Health Organization has talked about a 17% relative risk, and we have to talk about what the difference between a relative risk and an absolute risk is. You know, when we look at the real numbers, if your lifetime risk for colon cancer is 4%, which is what mm -hmm. it pretty much is for a Western individual, it now goes up to 5%. So 1% increase, which is a tiny amount. So 4% to 5% lifetime if you include meat in your diet and if you don't. And that's assuming you believe the epidemiology, which is not confounded and we mm -hmm. know that uh, per guys like professor david clerfield who was on that committee who was on the world health organization committee and voted against that that they did not allow all the evidence to be weighed they discounted much of the evidence up to one third of the panel was vegan and vegetarian which they did not disclose uh when they made that political statement and so uh if we look at the data coming out of asia you know all the epidemiology out of asia and Asia is not a small population. It's 4.5 billion people. It's most of the planet. When we look at the data on Asians, there is no relationship whatsoever with processed 
red cooked uncooked raw meat and colon cancer and so hmm. these sort of things you know you know you have to put these things in a big perspective and then again again with colon cancer what things are positively associated with colon cancer besides the the one uh, percent absolute risk increase from red meat uh, according to the world health organization well things like central obesity that greatly increases your risk a couple hundred percent in many cases uh in chronic inflammation greatly increases your risk a couple hundred percent um, hyperinsulinemia, again, also increases your risk a couple hundred percent. Well, what happens to people when they go on all meat diets? All of those other things get better. They tend to lose fat. They tend to lose central adiposity. Their inflammation tends to go away. Their hyperinsulinemia tends to improve. And so when we look at things in the big picture perspective, you know, I, I just don't find it very compelling to say that an all meat diet is going to give someone cancer. And it's interesting. I don't know if you're familiar with the specific carbohydrate diet. Have you heard of that? Yeah, sure. Uh -huh. And, uh, you know, that's obviously often used for people with Crohn's and colitis. And one of the staple foods there, they really say, like, starting with a meat and then adding from there. Um, but a big part of that diet is avoiding these processed carbs. And obviously, you know, carnivore diet is more extreme than just avoiding processed carbs. But it does seem to be a lot of times people with these uh, gut issues, they have negative reactions to different types of carbs. And I don't see too many people with negative reactions to various protein sources other than maybe like a, a milk protein source. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Some people do react poorly to dairy. And that's one thing I tell people. It's kind of at your personal tolerance. You know, I don't eat much dairy. If I eat personally, if I eat a lot of dairy, I don't feel as good. So I tend not to do that as much. But yeah, you're right. I mean, uh, many of the many of the, the inflammatory bowel disease diets are low residue diets, you know, FODMAP diets and stuff. So some of those things that are out there that, uh, uh, you know, but I think in my view, a carnivore diet is just more powerful. I mean, it eliminates pretty much everything. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, and, and again, I think the point of this diet is not that you need to eat meat the rest of your life and not ever eat anything else. I think it's, you know, if you're going to adopt it to try and, and particularly if you're solving health issues and GI issues are just one of them. I see tremendous improvements with people with joint pain, mental health disorders seem to get, get better. Skin issues like psoriasis and eczema seem to get better. You know, there's a whole, whole, whole autoimmune diseases, a whole host of things that seem to improve. And I think the, the point is use it to eliminate, find out, uh, you know, fix your symptoms if possible. And then, and then if you want to add things back in, you know, do it one at a time in a very objective, uh, you know, scientific fashion to see what you tolerate and what you don't. And I think many people that do this, it's kind of interesting, you know, when we contrast this diet to say another extreme diet, which would be a vegan diet, there are many people that, you know, do okay on a vegan diet. And there are, but there are a lot of people that, that don't do well and they end up failing. And what you see coming from those guys is they never, ever, ever go back to a vegan diet. They just said, mm -hmm. my health got wrecked. I'm never going back there. What we do see with the carnivore diet is a lot of people will do it three, six months, do well. And then they'll say, yeah, I just wanted to try something else. And they'll do it for a few months, but then they'll say six months later, say, well, I'm going to go back to a carnivore diet because I felt better. And, and I see that constantly. And so I think a lot of people kind of hover around, you know, they, they realize that meat is actually a health food. I mean, it's what we evolved on, quite honestly. And it's, it's to, to think it's somehow bad for us, I think is actually kind of bizarre. But many people will find that eating a lot of meat in the diet and then maybe including a few other things here and there it, it is a very long-term sustainable strategy for them. You know, a lot of those issues you mentioned, you know, the eczema, um, I think what else? I mean, even like depression, autoimmune diseases. Uh, I think a lot of these, the culprit, at least it seems to be with the research now, is inflammation, high levels of inflammation. And I think most people would agree that a huge benefit of most diets and why a lot of different diets can work is because they cause you to lose weight. And that obviously has a tremendous impact on health in general. Um, but it seems, I'm sure it seems that you believe the carnivore diet has benefits beyond just the weight loss itself. So I know we don't have a ton of research yet on this, but if you had to speculate on the mechanism by which it's working, aside from the fat loss, what would you think there? Yeah, I mean, there are clearly people that see resolution of symptoms prior to weight loss. And there are people that aren't overweight that see, see resolution of symptoms. And so I think certainly weight loss can be a benefit. And I think for most people that are obese, losing weight is a, a health benefit. I don't think there's any doubt about that. Um, I think that, you know, there are, there are a number of things that probably are in play here. One is, you know, gut permeability. I think gut permeability, many people link, believe is clearly linked to things like autoimmune diseases and probably a, a bunch of other things. Well, per, perhaps mental health disease uh, disorders, perhaps uh, arthritis and other things. And so I think 
uh, things that seem to in to restore gut integrity uh, seem to help with that. And I think a carnivore diet does that. And there's some research coming out of Europe, which, which demonstrates that. Mm. Um, I think, you know, eliminating some of these problematic foods. I think the industrial seed oils are very problematic. I think they cause uh, just direct tissue damage. I think, I think, you know, some of the oxidized, uh, uh, uh polyunsaturated fats, the omega-6 fats are uniquely damaging to our tissues. We know that those things accumulate, uh, in our tissues. There's, there's good evidence to do that. When we take fat biopsies on people, we can see how much of that omega-6 is accumulated and it's much higher than it was 50 years ago. So we're getting that, that stuff is being stored within our tissues and our body fat, probably in our neural tissue, probably everywhere. Uh, in our in our tissue, in our cell membranes, and all that stuff. So I think that's a problem. I think uh, possibly eliminating some of the sugars from the diet is again another thing. Advanced glycation end products, which can form endogenously, and that tends to occur in a high, you know, sugar environment, particularly in the in the in the in the presence of fructose. Fructose is actually more glycating than glucose even, and so I think the exposure to lots of high fructose corn syrup via things like sodas and stuff like that probably is independently also problematic. And I think the fact that, you know, meat has so many nutritious things in it, you know, that are, you know, n you know, the, the, uh, appropriate amino acid, you know, profile, uh, the, the, the fats that we need, the omega threes and the omega six that we need, uh, the monounsaturated fat. Most people don't know that beef is mostly monounsaturated fat. Mm -hmm. You know, we always get hung up on the saturated fat, but it's right. more than 50% monounsaturated fat. Um, things like compounds like carnosin, which is only found in meat, is an incredibly powerful anti-glycating uh, agent, which, uh, you know, that, again, reverses some of this glycation damage, which is shown to be, you know, problematic for all organs, but particularly the nerve, uh, you know, the, the brain and the, ner the nervous system. And so preventing things like dementia. Uh, carnitine, again, we see that people that have low levels of carnitine, uh, and this typically shows up in people who exclude meat from the diet, aka vegetarians and vegans, have higher rates of, well, we know people with low carnitine have higher rates of uh, major depressive disorder. So maybe including more carnitine in the diet by meat is helpful. Things like taurine are in there, more bioavailable zinc, iron, you know, these other minerals that, again, eating plants, you know, and again, I don't want to say all plants are bad, but, but certainly from a bioavailability standpoint and a lack of what we call anti-nutrients, things like oxalate, things like phytates, which bind up a lot of these uh, these minerals that we can't absorb because of the, you know, the the, the substances which are in the plants and make that nutrition harder to achieve. So I think you're just getting better nutrition. You're avoiding a lot of really these problematic, toxic things like high fructose corn syrup, uh, omega six oils, uh, and then and then the, the the probably the reparation of the of a, of a leaky gut situation. I think all those things combine to make it a very powerful and effective health, healthy diet. Awesome. And we talked a lot about the misconceptions so far with this carnivore diet, you know, that it causes all these issues or even that it's entirely saturated fat. Um, what are some of the misconceptions you see often with vegans and what they believe about the health of their diet? Well, I think, you know, you know, there, there's this whole concept of acid foods and alkaline foods, and we have this mucusless Right. vegan raw fruitarian craziness and i mean you know first of all uh your body maintains its ph particularly its blood ph and with an extremely narrow range very aggressively we and just by having functioning lungs just by breathing and having functioning kidneys you well regulate that so food has almost no impact on that it might you know a high protein diet may acidify the urine a little bit but it doesn't have any impact on cellular health or, uh, you know, acidity on cellular health or, um, you know, blood, blood serum, you know, if your pH gets down too low, you know, if it goes down below seven, it normally sits around seven, three, five, to seven, four, five. If you got it down to seven, you're dead. You yeah. basically don't survive that. So it's extremely critical, you know, so as long as you can breathe, you're going to regulate your own pH. So that's, that's one of the issues. Uh, the other, you know, the other thing is the, this sort of, uh, belief that, uh, a diet rich in antioxidants and phytonutrients is somehow super, super superior. There, first of all, there are no essential requirements for any of that stuff. We, there's no, there, you cannot name a single phytonutrient that we require. You know, you don't need sulforaphane. You don't need tannins or lectins or any of those things. Um, there are 
you know, pretty good evidence out there showing that exogenous antioxidants, things we get particularly from supplements, you know, people supplementing vitamin E, vitamin C, taking them in pills, and even as they come in, in the form of plants, these antioxidants are designed to work in plant systems. They, first of all, they're destroyed by our gastrointestinal tract, so much of it, a very low percentage of actually absorbed, and it doesn't, it's not very effective in the human system. So all these high in antioxidant foods and berries that you see and all these foods that they put in there doesn't do diddly squat for us. Uh, we have our own endogenous antioxidant system, primarily things like glutathione and uh, uh, superoxide dismutase and all these other things that we produce endogenously. Those are the things that you know, take care of our antioxidant needs. We don't need these extra things uh, given to us. And in fact, there's, there's actually evidence out there with supplementing with antioxidants actually causes more harm uh, than good. And Harvard's in a paper on that. You can, you can mm -hmm. look that up to see for yourself. Uh, so that's, you know, those are some of these misconceptions. The, uh, the belief that vegetarians and vegans will live longer. You know, there's a couple Seventh-day Adventist studies and remember, the Seventh-day Adventist Church was founded on the tenets of vegetarianism back to a gal named Ellen G. White in the, in the 1800, late 1800s, where she had visions that meat was causing cancer and bad force. And so this is where this church originated from. And then they, you know, they, they got into Battle Creek, Michigan with the, with the Kellogg's brothers, and they infiltrated nutrition. And the American Dietetics Association was started by uh, uh, vegetarians, you know, that were Seventh-day Adventists. And so we've had mm -hmm. this vegetarian belief ever since you know, nutrition started. But the belief that they live longer is not borne out in any, you know, studies that actually control for confounders. You know, the 45 and up study out of Australia, which was done in 2017, largest study ever done in the Southern Hemisphere, 250,000 people, showed zero benefit with regards to mortality, you know, life, uh, you know, long longevity conferred upon people that exclude meat from their diet. In fact, even though it showed that the vegetarians and the vegans were more health conscious, they engaged in more healthier behaviors, they didn't even live any longer. So what that means to me is, you know, maybe it's even a net negative because you don't live longer. You know, if you look at places like India, which is the most vegetarian country on the planet, you know, we've got uh, somewhere up to 40% of their, their population is vegetarian. They have extremely poor life expectancy, 68. You know, it's very low. If we contrast that to places like Hong Kong, Hong Kong has 7 million people. Their life expectancy is around 84, 85, longest lived people on the planet. They eat more meat than anybody else on the entire planet. It's very easy to find. You look up Hong Kong life expectancy and they look up Hong Kong meat consumption. Mm -hmm. And you'll see that they live the longest and eat the most meat. And so this whole misconception about vegans don't die or they, don't, they live longer than anybody else is just a bunch of wistful thinking based on highly biased epidemiologic studies coming out of the Seventh-day Adventist Church primarily. Um, you know, this whole thing about, you know, when you talk about well, what, what does a vegan die of? Their number one leading cause of vegans, cause of death, is heart disease. You know, that's right. clear from the data as well. And so this whole thing that they're, they're heart attack proof or whatever is just more BS you know, if, you, if you look at the actual data on that stuff. And so it's kind of... Uh, you know, those are those are the health things. I mean, there's some there's some animal, you know, environmental things, which I think are also a bunch of garbage and some of these ethical stuff, too. We can get into that if you're interested. But but from the health standpoint, there's a lot of uh, claims that they make, which are completely bogus. Yeah, you know, I don't know too much about the uh, environmental side of it, so I'd be interested to hear what you have to say about it. Yeah, so I, I know quite a bit about the environmental side about it. So one of the things that vegans will also often say is the number one thing you can do to protect the environment and protect the earth is to give up meat, okay? And so when we look at it from a greenhouse gas uh, emissions standpoint, when we look at the data, there was a video, a movie called Cowspiracy that came out oh, a couple, maybe a decade or so ago. And they, they said in that video uh, that 51% of all greenhouse gas emissions come from animal livestock. And that is patently false. That's completely wrong. It was based on a, on a really just debunked study, but they still can continue to quote that data. And so something, the FAO, the, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN, did a, a life cycle assessment back in 2006 looking at this. And in that study, they, rec they, they said that, no, it's actually about 18%. So 18% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions come from uh, agriculture. Well, that is, is a better number than 51%, but even that was wrong because 
it turns out that they fail to do uh, a life cycle assessment on things like cars and transportation and industry, and they only did it on cows. And so they agreed and they revised their numbers down to 14%. So now if we look at, you know, greenhouse gas emissions are now 14% worldwide, and that's still not small, but it's something that is not, you know, the biggest driver. But now if we, now if we look at where does that 14% come from? So 80%, and this is, this is according to the International Panel on Climate Change, 80% of that 14% comes from third world and developing countries. And so places like Africa where people are starving, parts of Asia where, you know, they have, you know, just very inefficient uh, backwards, you know, 100, 200, 300 years old agricultural practices. Those guys are very inefficient. And so the place to go vegan would be in, you know, Central Africa or, you know, where everybody's starving anyway, you know, so to make those people go vegan would be crazy. That's where most of the... Right greenhouse gases are coming. If we, if we look at places like the United States, for instance, we've got very good data on this. If you go to the EPA, go to epa.gov and type in, you know, greenhouse gas emissions by sector, agriculture, all of agriculture, not just animal agriculture, but plant agricultural too, makes up about 9% of our greenhouse gas emissions. If we look at the animal sector, it's about 4%. If we look at cattle, it's about 1.9%. So mm. by not eating a steak in the United States, you are making, you know, you would make a 1.9% difference in the U.S. output, which is minimal. If we look at transportation, it's about 25%. If we look at energy, it's about 25%. If we look at uh, other industries, it's about 25%. Residential is about 10%. And so, and so if you uh, were to, you know, look, look at these numbers realistically, and you got you got to look what you can do locally. So if, if I, me, myself, you, and every American in the United States were to completely go vegan, you know, completely give it up, and every animal that's domesticated were to magically just disappear from the planet, right? We were to, to make those all disappear. The impact on greenhouse gases worldwide would be about 0.38%. That's how much difference all of us going vegan in the United States would make. So you have to think... Wow. You know, why go vegan, you know, go vegan in, in Chad or Sudan, you know, maybe you'll make a difference. Of course, you might starve to death. But so we have to we have to put this stuff in a realistic perspective. And then people talk about, well, you're destroying the Brazilian rainforest, right? Well, guess what? In the United States, we're not destroying the Brazilian rainforest. In fact, our forest cover has increased significantly over the last 100 years. Same thing in Europe. Yes, it's true that people in Brazil need to get their act together and not clear down the forest. You know, some of that is done for soybeans, which are fed to some of the cattle. But guess what? That soybean is being planted primarily for soybean oil, which humans eat in abundance. Right now in the U.S., 6% of our calories come from soybean oil. But those soybeans are being planted, and then the cows will eat the leftovers from those soybean products. They will eat the hulls. They'll eat the stems. They'll eat the ground-up meal that's left over after the oil has been extracted. So it's not that these cows are generating all these soybeans for the most part. Um, if we look at grain production worldwide, when we talk about wheat, when we talk about rice, when we talk about uh, barley and rye and other things, grain production is eaten, about 70% of all grains are eaten by human beings. And so to say that cows are eating up all the grains, it's also false. They do eat more of the corn, in the United States in particular, they eat more, most of the corn that we produce, well, they eat more of the, the corn that's produced in the United States than we do as humans. If we look at Iowa, for example, Iowa is the largest corn producing state in the United States. 53% of their corn goes to ethanol production, okay? 5% of it directly goes to cattle. About 15% goes to pigs and chicken. About 15% goes to corn syrup. Uh, 10 or 15% of it's exported. And so, and then some of it goes to the alcohol industries uh, to make alcohol, you know, the grain-based alcohol. And then a certain percentage of that distiller's grain, once they're utilized, are fed back to the cows. So cows are not eating all the all the corn. And if we look at the agricultural land in the U.S. and we were to take all the agricultural land, what percentage of it? Even and this is assuming the cows are getting grain, and not all cows get grain, but many of them, you know, most of them in the U.S. do. But about two percent of the agricultural land in the United States is devoted to raising grain for cattle. The other 98 percent has nothing to do with cattle being raised for, for grain. So the numbers they put out are very misleading. They'll talk about, well, this, there's a whole bunch of cows eat a lot of this grain. You know, cows spend most of all cows, whether they're grain fed or grass finished, uh, are spending the vast majority of their life in pasture 
regenerating the soil, you know, you know, laying down, you know, manure throughout the soil. Uh, 86% of what they eat is not human edible. That's grass, that's forage, that's shrubs, you know, that's bushes, stuff we can't eat. And they turn that into highly valuable prized nutrition. In fact, with regard to, with regard to protein, they upcycle it. And so they take about uh, 0.6 grams of edible protein, human edible protein, and they turn it into one gram of beef protein. Mm. So they actually upcycle, uh, which is not, you know, now, now we still feed them in some cases, some of the grain, but again, if you look at, if you take the U S cattle inventory survey right now, there's about 93 million, 94 million cattle in the U S right now. At any given one time, about 14 million of them are getting fed in a feedlot. The rest of them are, are around in the pasture, running around. If you drive through the countryside, you see cows, Sure, in South Carolina, there's cows out in the fields grazing. 93% of all cattle ranches are owned by mom and pop, you know, family ranchers in the United States. There's about 750,000 of them. So 93% of them are just under about 50 head of cattle, okay? And then there's about 15,000 feedlots that they go into, which are also small. And then there's a few big ones that are out there that people don't like. But, I mean, you know, there's so much disinformation from these uh, vegan activists that it's, but it's, it's, it's gone into the public collective and people believe that the same thing, the water argument. Also, they talk about, well, cows take a lot of water. Well, here's what they measure. They measure something called green water, which is basically, so if you have a cow sitting in a field in your backyard, every drop of rain that hits that yard, every snowflake that falls will be counted into the water that goes into raising that cow, whether the cow uses any of it or not. Is, is irrespective, you know, it doesn't matter. So all that rainfall and about 80 to 90, 85 to 90 percent of all the water that cattle drink in the U.S. is rainwater, which would have fallen regardless. And it's not as if that water just magically disappears and is gone from the earth forever. I mean, the cow drinks water and guess what? They respire, they breathe, the water vapor goes back in the air, they urinate, they defecate. All that water goes back into the ground, it's recycled, it goes back you know, back into the atmosphere through, through the carbon, through the water cycle. And so these numbers are incredibly misleading as, as regard to them using up water, eating all the food, uh, creating all the greenhouse gases. Methane emissions from animal agriculture has not really changed much in about 50 years. In fact, yeah. they've, they've arguably even gone down a little bit. But methane levels have gone up a little bit in the atmosphere. And we're finding out that that is coming from natural gas leaks. We're finding out that they're way underestimating the natural gas leaks. But but again, methane, which tends to be a more potent greenhouse gas, some people estimate around 20 times more potent than carbon uh, dioxide, is only in the atmosphere for a few years. Like 12 years is a half-life. When you contrast that to carbon dioxide, which goes into the atmosphere and stays there for thousands of years, Methane is really a minor issue, even though it's more potent initially, it goes away. Uh, and, and so the real issue and the problem is when people say don't eat a, you know, don't eat a steak because you, so you can save the environment. Fossil fuel uh, production is by far immensely the problem with regard to greenhouse gas. Now, there's people out there that don't believe that man is causing you know, global climate change. And that's that's a different issue. But if you believe that is the case and many people do. It's the fossil fuels that are driving that way more than the cattle. I mean, we've had grazing animals. You know, in the U.S., we had, you know, buffalo herds, 60, 60 million or more running through the plains, which is almost as many cows as we have today. Uh, and, and there's no issues. And before that, before the, megafa the megafaunal extinction, which occurred, you know, 25 to 10,000 years ago, we had orders of magnitude, more grazing animals. I mean, it, it was teeming. Uh, with life. I mean, if we look at, you know, according to Felisa Smith, who's a professor at a U University of New Mexico in the anthropology department, in the uh, anthropology zoology department, the number and size of animals that we had 100,000 years ago, the average size of an animal was around 1,000 pounds. Mm -hmm. Today, the average size of an animal is about 20 pounds. When you look at all animals combined, and so we had so many more big methane producing, grass eating, grazing animals you know, back then it was, it was just orders of magnitude in what we have now. And so the argument that the cattle are driving climate change is absolutely ridiculous. It is, it is driven largely uh, by vegan ideology, but more importantly, there are companies that stand to make a lot of money and profit by getting you to eat their fake meat products 
uh, and, and they're paying for it and they're pushing that agenda out there. And it's in the media 24 seven. We see it every day. Go meet to save the planet, go meet to save the planet, go buy our fake beyond meat burgers, go buy our impossible burgers, go mm-hmm. buy our synthetic lab meat when we make it. This is what's being pushed out there and it's being done for profit. And I think that is a shame. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's, it's going to harm a lot of people. I was going to ask where, you know, Obviously, I think plenty of people believe it. You know, I, I don't think most vegans are out there thinking like, you know, I'm going to lie about this so I can get my way. I think it probably is just pushed by a select group of people. And most people don't fact check things. Most people don't really look beyond the first thing they see on an Instagram post or a Facebook or whatever. And so I imagine that that's kind of how it's peddled to more and more people. Yeah, I mean, clearly, I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's for them, it's the ends justifies the means, you know, and so uh, they have an agenda, they're willing to, you know, they're on their game 24 seven, I mean, they're out there constantly pushing this message, you know, whether it's true, or not. it's like politics, you know, I mean, whoever, you know, whoever says that something the loudest, the most often people tend to believe that as the truth. And, and, yeah. you know, I mean, the health message is very easy to test yourself. I mean, go on an all meat diet for three months and see what happens to your health. And I will tell you, very likely you're going to notice tremendous health improvements. And so that one is very easy to, to, to debunk. You know, the vegan, uh, the environmental arguments, you have to actually dig into the fact. You have to listen to people that actually know what they're talking about and not filmmakers that have agendas that they're going to quote whatever statistics they want. Because there's, you know, there's a lot of statistics out there. There's a lot of, uh, uh, you know, studies that can support any argument. You know, you can make right. any argument and you can, be, and you can make a very compelling argument. And it's very easy to pull on people's heart springs and show a picture of a poor little animal that's been abused and say, this is what you're doing when you eat meat uh, and, and, and distort the reality of the, the fact right. that most people, and again, most people, and I've been out there on cattle ranches and talked to these ranchers and folks and talk to them all the time. These people truly, truly care about the animals they work with. They wouldn't have gone into that business if they wanted to be mean to animals or they wanted to torture animals. doesn't mean that there are some idiots out there that do that occasionally. But that is, by and, by and large, not the situation with the vast majority of the people that spend their lives, their careers, learning how to take care of these. I mean, there's people that, I mean, up in the, up in the colds of Montana, the cow gets sick in the morning. They bring the cow into the home with them. You know, they mm-hmm. sit there and put it by the fire and put blankets on it and nurse it back to health. I mean, these are people that truly care. It does them no good to have sick animals. It's not good for... Uh, their relationship, you know, or their livelihood, their, their, you know, or their income, you know, and it's just, so this, this, this sort of thing that people are out there trying to uh, abuse these animals just for profit is, I mean, it's just abhorrent to think that, that people believe that. Interesting. Um, you know, we talked a little bit before about the, the fat content and it's, I think it's mostly monounsaturated fat, but obviously it is still very high saturated fat. And just because I like to experiment with myself and I do get a lot of blood work done and I test ketone levels and things like that. Um, when I was doing my like first keto diet with the, uh, the sticks or not, sorry, not the sticks, like the actual, like the blood test. Um, I found that when I was eating really high saturated fat foods, like pretty much as fatty cut as I could get, I was in ketosis in like the two to three millimolar range within like a week. Um, and then I wanted to see again, how it would affect blood work when I went to entirely leaner cuts. And then added the fat with like olive oil and things like that. Um, I actually found it much harder to get in ketosis. I was generally around like 0.5, 0.6. Um, it, so for one, is ketosis even a goal of yours? Are you even in ketosis with the amount of protein you're eating? Or is that, if anything, just like a side effect? Yeah, I think we're finding uh, that protein does not tend to kick people out of pro, uh, ketosis in, in, in real in clinical practice. I mean, we're seeing more and more people that'll, they'll, they'll, they'll report that they, you know, they had 200 grams of protein, 400 grams of protein, and they're still in ketosis. And so I think that is something that people are coming around to discovering that that's not the issue. Now, it's not my goal to be in ketosis. I've never personally measured my blood ketones. I don't really care. Yeah. I care about, you know, physical performance, body composition, how I feel, how I function. Ketones are, you know, they're a distraction. I mean, you know, I mean, there's a lot of things that go into that. Uh, how much do you produce? How much do you waste? How much do you utilize? And all those things are variables. And so if you get really effective at utilizing ketones, uh, and Stephen Finney will acknowledge this, that he sees people that are in a relatively low level of ketones. You know, they used to call nutritional ketosis 0.5, you know, mm-hmm. millimolar. And now they're seeing around 0. 0.3, 0. 0.4, still are getting the effects of ketosis. And so I don't, 
I don't worry about it personally. I mean, you know, I, I think, you know, maybe if I was treating uh, cancer or epilepsy, it might be something that I was more concerned about. Yeah. But again, my, you know, I think at the end of the day, I'm a big picture type of guy. I look at, you know, what's important to me. Is it more important than my blood ketones or, you know, uh, 3.6 or that I feel good? And I will tell you every time I'd rather feel good and I don't care. Right. Now, it may have coincided both those things occur at the same point, but to, to stress and have anxiety. One of the nice things about this carnivore diet is you don't have to think about it. You just eat. Mm-hmm. You enjoy yourself. Eat food. You're not, you're not calculating. You're not, you know, you, there's no animal out in the wild where you're it's peeing on urine strips or walking around <laughs> with a Fitbit or, you know, with a macronutrient calculator or a mac- micronutrient calculator. They just eat. And I think, I think arguably shoot humans should have a diet that allows us the freedom to just friggin' eat and not worry about stuff. And I think this is what happens when people go on a, you know, either a fully carnivorous or highly carnivorous diet. It just naturally, for most people, it's very freeing. It's very satisfying. Uh, it fits, you know, it fills all the bills as far as I'm concerned. And I think it's just, it just, it just makes sense from a, you know, we're just an animal standpoint. So if somebody wants to give it a shot, do you recommend just going straight into it or would you have them just kind of slowly reduce their carbs, kind of like you did where you just kept dropping until you got there? Yeah, I think that, you know, and, and, I, and I've, you know, I've got a book coming out on this uh, and I talk about different ways to go into this. I think there's pros and cons to each strategy. You know, I, I liken it to, you know, you can you can have if you got a Band-Aid that's been on your on your on, on your skin for a couple of days, and you want to pull it off, you either slowly peel it off. Or you yeah. just rip the thing off and be done with it. And I think I think the analogy works pretty well. I think for people that are particularly coming from a high carbohydrate diet, going straight carnivore where you just drop all carbohydrates and all fiber can be a little bit challenging and painful. And there can be some you know transition uh, symptoms that might make it prohibitive. And so yeah. some people run into that. Uh, there are other people that they they feel that you know slowly doing this thing, you, you never pull it off. You never you can never give up those things. So some people. You know, and some people argue that sugar addiction is not real. I would say probably it is. Uh, some people will say that they, if, if, unless they go cold turkey, they can't give up those things, and they keep having these cravings that are, you know, nagging them. They keep caving. You know, it's you know, at the end of the day, and they're they're, you know, they're still a little hungry, and they, they go into the cabinet and they, they eat all the chocolate bars or they eat all the, you know, whatever that's laying around because they just can't they can't handle that. And so I think, you know, there's either. I mean, I personally, yeah, I played with a carnivore diet. I did a week here, two weeks there, 10 days here, you know, five days here and, and, and just felt good when I was doing it. And I did that for a while and then I went for 30 days and then I've been for two years. But I think either way can be good. Many people like we talked about earlier on with the, with the stuff with, with the diarrhea, a lot of people will, will find that slowly tapering fiber out of their diet can help particularly with that particular symptom just because again the colon has to get used to not seeing all that fiber in the diet and so for some people you know maybe gradually cutting out fiber you know 25 percent a week you know for over a month might be a good good strategy so i think either one works you know if you're if you're already on a ketogenic diet or a low carb diet then maybe it's easier just to go straight up cold turkey and just go for it uh one of the biggest issues that people run into is they have a hard time eating enough and a lot of people under eat and then they complain about low energy. You know, I'm just fatigued. You know, uh, I'm lethargic. Uh, and I think that's one of the drawbacks uh, is just because they don't eat enough. And so you have to really, I used to say, well, I still say, eat like it's your job at the beginning. Really focus on putting away the food. Don't worry about, you know, initially don't worry about um, uh, losing weight or body composition. I think it's more important to transition over to the transition to metabolism uh, get used to eating this way, get those, get those addictions, you know, those cravings conquered. And then you can start playing with, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to mess with some of these variables, whether I'm going to eat a little leaner or, you know, higher protein or higher fat or whatever, whatever you want to do. Gotcha. And, uh, so just wrap up with a quick speed round. It could just be one word answers or one sentence. Sure. Sure. <laughs> so, uh, you know, you are a multi-sport athlete currently on this diet. What is your favorite activity or sport to do? Uh, I like explosive type stuff, jumping, throwing, that type of thing. Cool, cool. And uh, what is your favorite go-to carnivore meal? Uh, ribeye steaks and, and, and now eggs a little bit. I'd stay eggs in there, steak and eggs probably. Cool. And uh, how many vegans does it take to fight a carnivore? <laughs> 
yeah, I guess it depends on the vegan. I don't know. You know, the biggest, uh, the biggest, this is kind of funny, the biggest animal in the world is a carnivore. Most people don't know that, but it's a blue whale. Blue whales are completely carnivorous. And so the vegans often talk about their elephants and oh, stuff yeah. like that as being vegan or gorillas. But uh, yeah, I don't, I, you know, I don't. So, uh, so you, you said you got a book coming out. Um, you want to talk about that? Yeah, Carnivore Diet. Uh, it's it's with the publisher now. Uh, I just finished up some final edits on that. Should be out early part of this year, probably early spring. Um, you know, I, I kind of cover, you know, the, you know, historical stuff, evolutionary stuff, some of the biochemistry, some a lot of the science, some problems with nutrition science. I talk about uh, a lot of success stories people have. I talk about how to implement the diet. Some of the issues that people may have with transitioning, how to how to transition in, how to transition out of the diet. I have a chapter called "Go Vegan," which I kind of debunk a lot of the vegan ideology and some of the stuff that's in there. Uh, and so that's you know a lot of you know lots and lots of references, scientific references that support. Now again, we don't have a lot of carnivore studies per se, but there is a lot of evidence out there that kind of is, is sort of. Uh, uh, germane to the carnivore topic that I include in there. So those things are in there. Uh, but I think it's a, it's a good uh, resource for people that uh, want to know more and want to know how to do it. And it's, it's, it's for the general public. I mean, I didn't make it too technical because, you know, I'm writing for a general audience. You know, there's a lot sure. of people in the carnivore community that want all the, the minutiae details about mitochondrial function. I, th- I, I think that's something that, you know, is maybe – more for a different audience, but I think for the general person that's just interested in what the hell is this carnivore diet, what's it about, why are people doing it, what's maybe some of the rationale, I think it's a good, uh, it's going to be a good uh, resource. Awesome. And you're on Instagram, you're also on Twitter, anywhere else people can find your work? Um, so I've got a YouTube channel where I, I, about once a week, I'll throw up a video. So it's just Sean, S-H-A-W-N Baker. I think if you took Sean Baker Carnivore, you can probably find it if you put it in YouTube. Uh, Instagram is Sean S H A W N Baker B A K E R nineteen sixty seven. My Twitter is S Baker M D. Um, we have World Carnivore Tribe, which is my Facebook group. What I started last January, we're just about to hit twenty five thousand people. Wow. Uh, we are now the biggest carnivore Facebook group on the planet. There's a couple others that have have just over twenty thousand that we just surpassed uh, with, with within one year. Uh, so that's continuing to grow. Um, trying to think what else i think that's it you know i've got i've got a little uh, thing going for world carnival month right now where uh we're getting people signed up on email and we're getting them you know discounts on different meats you know a bunch of companies are now stepping up to support world carnival month and they're providing discounts on their meat products which i think is awesome so i'm getting that information out there for people that are signing up and so that's that's just another and i and i and i on the emails i'll put you know i'll put a little info like studies and just little thoughts and things that help cool. people to, to learn more about this stuff. Cool. All right. Well, thanks so much for talking today, man. Dave, it's been a pleasure. And thanks for uh, donating to the Autism Speaks charity. I really appreciate you doing that. And uh, let me know what else I can do, man. Awesome.